you are. Well, today, Mother's Day, we're going to study through Joshua chapter 2. If you'd make your way, and in your bulletin you see the title, strangest title you've ever heard for a Mother's Day message, Rahab, a great role model. Rahab the harlot, as she is described or called many times in Scripture. What a great role model she is for every mom and every grandmother present here today. I know it sounds weird, but truly, Rahab illustrates exactly the kind of person that I am and that I want to be who was gripped by being an enemy of God in the grips of the enemy of God, Satan, and surrendered to the will of God when he visited my heart and now wanting to honor him with my life. That was Rahab. What a great role model. What a great example she is. You know that only Rahab and Sarah, Abraham's wife, are the only women specifically mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11, the hall of faith. That is how important this woman is in Scripture. Joshua chapter 2, if you'd look at that, and we'll read the narrative. And Joshua, the son of Nun, sent out of Shittim two men to spy secretly, saying, Go view the land, even Jericho. And they went and came into a harlot's house named Rahab and lodged there. And it was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, there came men in here tonight of the children of Israel to search out the country. And the king of Jericho sent unto Rahab, saying, Bring forth the men who are come to thee, who, are in, who have entered into thine house, for they have come to search out all the country. And the woman took the two men and hid them and, and said thus, There came men unto me, and I knew not from where they were. And it came to pass about the time of the shutting of the gate, when it was dark, that the men went out. Where the men went, I know not. Pursue after them quickly, for you shall overtake them. But she had brought them up to the roof of the house and hid them with the stalks of flax, which she had laid in order upon the roof. And the men pursued after them the way to the Jordan unto the fords. And as soon as they were pursued, as soon as they who pursued after them were gone out, they shut the gate. And before they were laid down, she came up upon them, uh, unto them upon the roof. And she said unto the men, I know that the Lord hath given you the land, and that your terror is fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did unto the two kings of the Amorites, who were on the other side of the Jordan, Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. And as soon as we had heard these things, our hearts did melt. Neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. Now, therefore, I pray you, uh, swear unto me by the Lord, since I have shown you kindness, that you also show kindness unto my father's house and give me a true token, and that you will save alive my father, my mother, my brethren, my sisters, and all they have, and deliver our lives from death. And the men answered her, Our life for yours, if you utter not this our business. And it shall be, when the Lord hath given us the land, that you will deal kindly and truly with thee. Check that. That we will deal kindly and truly with thee. Then she let them down by a cord through the window, for her house was upon the town wall, and she dwelt upon the wall. And she said unto them, Get you to the mountain, lest the pursuers meet you, and hide yourselves there three days, until the pursuers have returned. And afterward may you go your way. And the men said unto her, We will be blameless of this thine oath, which thou hast made us swear. Behold, when we come into the land, thou shalt bind this line of scarlet thread in the window, by which thou didst let us down. And thou shalt bring thy father, thy mother, thy brethren, all thy father's household home unto thee. And it shall be that whosoever shall go out of the doors of thine house into the street, his blood shall be upon his head, and we will be guiltless. And whosoever shall be with thee in the house, his blood shall be on our head, if any man, uh, if any lay uh, hand be upon him. And if thou utter this our business, then we will be free of thine oath, which thou hast made us to swear." 
And she said, according unto your word, so be it. And she sent them away, and they departed, and she bound the scarlet line in the window. And they went and came unto the mountain and abode there three days until the pursuers were returned. And the pursuers sought them throughout all the way, but found them not. So the two men returned and descended from the mountain and passed over and came to Joshua, the son of Nun, and told him all things that befell them. And they said unto Joshua, Truly the Lord hath delivered into our hands all the land, for even all the inhabitants of the country do faint because of us. This narrative is uh, easy to understand, very little need uh, to, to explain or to have it interpreted in any way. Joshua the captain, uh, 40 years earlier, he was the one, he and Caleb, who were not filled with doubt. The rest of the, 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 they were, and so they wandered in the wilderness 40 years, and now he is approaching the land using wisdom. He's approaching it strategically. He's approaching it carefully, and this is the narrative of uh, having come out of the wilderness and now about ready to enter Jericho. Three primary points, if you're taking notes, about Rahab, a great role model, a great role model to follow. First of all, who she was? Who was Rahab. Well, verse 1 tells us she was a woman of the flesh. The, the text clearly identifies Rahab as a prostitute a number of times in, uh, in the Bible, in other places. It calls her that. Um, and uh, immediately, uh, the spies that Joshua had sent out encountered her. Now, why did they go immediately to, uh, and it wasn't difficult to find. I mean, she was, uh, lived on top of the wall, and anyone could have told you uh, there's the house of prostitution because everybody in the city knew about it. Uh, she was visited by uh, various uh, men in the city, and she was uh, abhorred and scorned by all of the women. And so everyone, she was notorious. And when they came into the city, strategically, uh, they ask about that, uh, where uh, she would be, uh, where this person would be. And so they approached it strategically. They weren't looking for a hotel. They were looking for a particular home uh, where they could go. And of course, the people of the city just presumed these are men who are traveling and they, uh, they want to uh, have a, a fleshly time, we'll say. And so they inquired about that. They were directed to her house and she immediately um, was identified by the townspeople of being a prostitute. And Rahab illustrates uh, in a physical sense, what is wrong with every person ever born except for Jesus, of course, namely sin. Uh, everyone in uh, human history uh, since the fall uh, in the garden of Adam and Eve have been sinners and are sinners outside of the grace of God. Her physical debauchery is illustrative of all who are outside of Christ. I tell you, to the degree, uh, uh, it's amazing. I'm not sure how we got on the subject this morning uh, at breakfast, but Kathy and I uh, were talking about that. Oh, I know how. She was, uh, she was uh, thanking the Lord. You just have to hear her pray for me. It is, uh, it's amazing and a little embarrassing. Folks, she thinks I'm one of the greatest men there's ever been. Don't, sh don't say anything. <laughs> And, 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 of course, I'm, I'm blessed by that. And yet, at the same time, I'm really humbled by it because I have lived in, uh, in, my, uh, in my skin these 67 years. Can I get a witness? You know what I'm talking about, right? And, uh, and I said, well, it, it has to be the grace of God. It must be. And that's not just feigned humility. Uh, that's not just a, a canned answer. I said to her, you would not believe how depraved I was at, before I came to know the Lord, and I don't give her any details at all, but I, I was Rahab. I was Ray, a, a 20th century male version of Rahab, just debauchery. Now, not visiting houses of prostitution. I don't want you to be led to believe that never one time, and I thank the Lord for that, but still living out uh, depravity uh, in, uh, in about as uh, a profound way. I was out a whoring, as it were, in the world, just in utter rebellion from the Lord, just like Rahab was. And you say, well, I wasn't that bad. Uh, I wasn't a druggie or a drunk or a criminal and all. That's the problem with religious people. I think I'm just fine. I've done enough good works. I've done enough good things. I've given away enough money. I've helped enough people uh, to somehow that ought to measure up. No, whoever keeps the whole law and yet offends in 
one point. He is guilty of all of it, all of the weight, all of the condemnation, all of the judgment of the Lord will fall upon a person who's only committed one sin. And you've probably only committed one sin this hour. But you add up all the myriad of times that you have, multiple times that you have, and that I have. And I am as guilty, I was as guilty before Christ as Rahab was. I was created to have one allegiance, one commitment to the lover of my soul, and uh, I was nowhere near that. I was a man of the flesh in just as severe a way as Rahab was a woman of the flesh. And you know, uh, isn't it interesting how prostitutes are viewed by, uh, uh, by folks outside of the Lord, most folks outside of the Lord, with contempt, with scorn, and yet if that person could see himself or herself as God sees him or her, uh, uh, you would be appalled. And at the point of regeneration, when the Lord wakes you up, you do see the depravity of your life, and you do see that judgment uh, is hanging over you. She knew that judgment was coming. God was sending judgment, and of course, she was in the path of judge, judgment um, until the Lord was merciful to her. And so she was a woman of the flesh. Secondly, who she became. She became a woman of faith. It's very clear in Scripture in verses 2 through 17, there was a dramatic change in her life. You say, well, she changed because she was fearing judgment. Hello? That's a good reason to, to change your mind about something. Uh, if, uh, if you're heading down a, a road uh, and, the, and you see the sign, the bridge is out, and you know it's a torrential rain and, uh, and, uh, and you're going to be washed away in that stream below, which has become a, a raging river, you are fearful and you take action. And so it is a healthy thing to fear the Lord. Rahab went from being a prostitute, a pagan, to a child of the king in just a moment, folks, because it's still true, and it was true back then, Romans 5.20, where sin abounded, what happened? Grace did much more abound, super abounded. And so when sin was abundant, and it was in the life of Rahab, a, a, a harlot, a pagan in a condemned city, I mean sin, she was the personification of sin, and yet grace abounded because she turned her heart and believed. She was redeemed. In fact, Scripture says the very same thing for anyone to come to Him. You must do so by faith. For without faith, it is impossible to please Him. For he that comes to God must believe that He is. God, you exist. You're the great high and lifted up. And we see that in this text. Your God is the true God of heaven and earth, she said. She made a profession of faith. For he that comes to God must believe that he is, and he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So Rahab is a profound illustration of conversion. She went her own way for all of her life up to the point where she faced the certainty of judgment, life, and death, she came, be, had, had an awareness of the power of God, of the nature of God, who He is, and she wanted mercy in a believing heart, which is why Hebrews 11.31 dogmatically says, it was by faith that the harlot Rahab perished not with them, that believed not. In other words, the rest of the city, they didn't believe when she had received the spies with peace. So it's faith in the Lord, but faith must have an object. It's not just having faith in faith or just I believe in a nebulous way. No, it is faith in the true and living God, what the Lord has done um, and what He will do for those who turn to Him. And so she became a woman of faith. Now I want to ask, uh, uh, address a couple of issues about this issue of faith in, in the life of Rahab. First of all, faith was evident in her reception of Joshua's men. Faith always expresses itself. 
Faith is living. If it's not, then it is dead and it's no faith at all. The book of James speaks about that to a great degree when it says in James 2, 17 and 25 and 26, faith, if it hath not works, that is if it doesn't manifest itself, uh, if it's not evident, is dead being alone. Likewise also, was not Rahab the harlot justified by works, that is justified by what was evidenced when she had received the messengers and had sent them up out another way. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So her faith w- was made evident in how she acted and reacted. She says, I want to get on board with the God of Israel because he's the true God of heaven and earth. And secondly, you've probably noticed and you had in your mind, faith was evident in her deception of Jericho's men. Now we have a moral problem. Now we've got uh, uh, the, uh, the unbelievers will, uh, got, have God uh, in a corner. I'm surprised the Pharisees didn't, uh, uh, didn't bring this up to Jesus. Maybe they hadn't thought about it because you have to ask the question, was it proper for Rahab to lie, to deceive the king's men there in Jericho. Is it acceptable to lie if you're in the will of God, to deceive someone? Doesn't this open the Pandora's box of situational ethics if uh, Scripture says one thing, but in my circumstance, God understands and I'm going to uh, do something that would be against his will otherwise? How does one address this moral dilemma? Well, I'm going to leave that to you, but I'm going to give you a a couple of uh, scholars uh, who uh, have addressed this very issue, and and they take different positions on this. Norman Geisler, in his book, When Critics Ask, addressed this very issue of uh, what about Rahab hiding the spies? And he falls, uh, he defaults to the side of it was the will of God for her to do this. And let me offer the arguments uh, that he... um, that he makes on this. First of all, he says Rahab was hiding the spies because it was courageous faith. If she would have been found out hiding them, she didn't know what the outcome was going to be. She didn't know uh, what would end up happening. She was doing this in the moment. And so if she was found out, not only would they, uh, she would get worse treatment than than the spies would have gotten. She was a harlot. She was despised by the townspeople. She's now hiding the enemy in her house. Oh, they would have tarred and feathered her and, and, and hung her by her toenails. I mean, it would have been bad. And so he suggests hiding the spies was genuine, courageous faith. Uh, she, was not, she was not being de- deceitful and deceptive was not the issue. Uh, the issue was I'm going to do what God wants me to do. Pretty good argument. Second thing Geiser says is God does not hold someone accountable for an impossible moral conflict an impossible moral conflict. That is a moral conflict uh, that came upon you that you could not possibly have created and you can't possibly, that is in your own humanity, figure a way out. So uh, he says, uh, then what she did was fine, telling a lie because she was saving lives. Also, he said, one isn't held responsible for breaking a lesser law to uphold a higher law, i.e., uh, it's two in the morning. Someone uh, uh, gets severe laceration and, and arterial blood is spraying all over the place. Death is imminent. And so you race to the emergency room to take uh, that, uh, that person, uh, even if you break the speed limit. So there's a lot of reasons why one could si- say uh, that she, God was allowing this to take place. J. Carl Laney in his book, Answers to Tough Questions, takes the opposite side. And this is what he argues. He says, many times in the Bible, God um, records, has recorded, but doesn't say he approves. Is that accurate? Yes. Lots and lots and lots of times. I mean, just by virtue of, uh, of Rahab being called a harlot multiple times, in no way says God was stamping, putting his stamp of approval, approval on harlotry. Of course, that is accurate. And Laney says, divine approval of a person in general doesn't mean divine approval of every action of that person. Is that true? 
David was a man after God's own heart. Did David sinful, act sinfully at times? He absolutely did. So Laney is correct that endorsing a person is not endorsing every action and attitude of that person. We see that many times in Scripture. He also says the emphasis in the text is Rahab's faith, not her deceit. I would concur. I mean, she was courageous in hiding them. And so that's what's emphasized. And she was converted in the course of, of this scenario. Um, Laney said, lying is always viewed negatively in Scripture. Is that accurate? Thou shalt not lie, bear false witness. And so she was bearing false witness to these pagan soldiers of the king. Therefore, Laney said, Rahab's deception uh, isn't, was not the will of God. He could have created an open door for her in any other way that he wanted to. Therefore, she should not have lied. So I just wanted to address that. And I wanted you to leave you with that moral conflict in your own heart. Have a good Mother's Day today. <laughs> you, have, you have two guys who are scholars eminent scholars that everyone uh, uh, would say that's the case, who come down on either side of this issue. Should Rahab uh, have done this or not? Scripture put her in the hall of faith in Hebrews chapter 11. God viewed Rahab herself as redeemed. She was a child of faith, and in fact, uh, God blessed her life in the future as well. So thirdly, who she will be. Who she will be, a woman with a future. Verses 18 through 24 said earlier that a prostitute is despised by most everyone except Jesus. He sought to accept the wretched whom the religious will throw away. And the spies swore to, uh, that is the Israeli spies swore to protect Rahab and her family. They did because she fulfilled her part they fulfilled their part, so she had a future, and what a future it was and will be and forever will be the case. What kind of a future is it? Well, first of all, she was rescued from the city, but look at Matthew. Generations later, Matthew 1, 5 and 6 and verse 16 says this, and Salmon begot Boaz of Rahab. So she ended up marrying a, a man who was, from, who was Jewish, whose name was Salmon. Uh, I'll bet you if you check, I don't know this, he was probably of the tribe of Judah. Pastor, do you know if that's the case? Do you know off the top of your head? Uh, I'll bet you, I, I just, I'm just going to, I'm just going to put it out there that uh, I'm imagining. Paul, do you know? Is he of the tribe of Judah, Salmon? You know that definitively? I wish I would have looked into that. I, I think he was. That's significant. Now, lion of the tribe of Judah. And Boaz begot Obed of Ruth. And so you have Boaz and Ruth being married. And, and Boaz is the, um, is the child of Rahab. Um, let me just make sure I am getting this correct. Am I getting this correct? Salmon begot Boaz, yes, uh, uh, of Rahab. So Ra Boaz is Rahab's son, and Obed is Boaz and Ruth's son. And Obed begat Jesse. And Jesse begot David um, in the line of Christ in Matthew. So Rahab ended up as the great-great-grandmother of King David who was in the royal, not the physical, not the bloodline of Jesus, but in the royal line of of Jesus. You all following that? Uh, what Matthew said? This is massive. She was depraved. She encountered the true and living God, and she, her faith bore fruit, bore evidence, and her future is glorious. Praise the Lord. One day, a woman, Rahab, selling herself on the slave market of sin, Judgment hanging all around and moving in fast. And in a moment, she's confronted with 
the true and living God. She believed. She was rescued, given a new life and a glorious future. Now, mom, especially you moms of little ones and preteens uh, and teenagers and maybe young adults and maybe for the rest of life. I don't know. I've not walked in your shoes. But I've known some of you have felt like failures. Can I get a witness, ladies? You're not failures, but you've ever you've felt like a failure at times. Am I not saying something that's accurate? <laughs> you, don't, you don't want to go there, right, in your own mind. If in the worst case scenario, the worst case scenario, you were Rahab. And now look at Rahab. A glorious future. The end of the story has not taken place yet. So moms, if you feel worn out and battered and beaten down and judged in your own heart, you can have a glorious future. In fact, you will have a glorious future if you are in Christ. And you have access to the throne of grace to obtain mercy and help in time of need. You say, God, I need help with my children. I'm, uh, uh, I'm out of answers. I'm out of patience. I'm out of strength. And, and on and on. Well, then you're right in the place of Rahab. <laughs> That's a blessing. And you can call upon the true and living God for all that you need in this hour. Now, either that's true or it's not true. And if it's true, then go there. Follow him with all of your heart, moment by moment, trusting in him um, with every situation that you have in life. God prospered Rahab. And she came from the most desperate, despicable background one could have. And she was given new life and a future for all eternity. Lord, I'm so thankful that you included this narrative in Scripture. How the most vile sinners are given new life. When each one has turned to you in faith, based upon the claims of Christ, what, Lord, you have done. For by grace are we saved through faith. It's not of ourselves. It's a gift of God. And so, Lord, I'm so thankful that though a Rahab, you touched my heart. I came to the awareness of my need of who you are, what you have done. And now, all these decades later, continue to desire to follow you and be fruitful for the cause of Christ. Lord, I'm so thankful that so many here have that same testimony of Rahab. What a great role model of what it means to come out of depravity by faith and enter into kingdom living. And Lord, would you touch the hearts of any here today who haven't experienced that, have not experienced the grace of God unto salvation. And any uh, watching uh, by way of uh, online uh, ministry, that you would touch those hearts as well. And grant faith to trust you, repentance to turn from their own way, and be gloriously saved, as was Rahab, a daughter of faith. Have your will and way in this hour, Lord Jesus, in your blessed name we pray.